Okay, Matthew chapter 3. I'll read it out loud. You guys can follow along with me. Um, we already hit on part of this, but I want to start from the beginning again just for context. In those days, verse 1, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Um, then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Let's pray. And Jesus, we again come before you, and Lord, we thank you that you're a God who speaks. You're, you're a God who tells us what's up, and you don't mince words. You make things really clear for us. I like that about you. I like it that um, when you have a standard, it's not something that's wishy-washy. It's not something that changes. It's something that's just there. And um, Lord, you called us to a certain life. And as John was uh, preaching in the wilderness that um, the people of Israel needed to repent, um, Lord, we know it's true for each one of us, too. We need to have uh, a worldview where we've turned away from what the world has to say, and we've done a 180, and we're following after you. And so, God, I just pray that as we're going through and talking about repentance and baptism and all the stuff in this passage, uh, Lord, that you'd uh, open our ears to hear, and that we'd be hearing what the Spirit has to say to the church this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And you can have a seat. You know, uh, I really like this passage. Actually, I really like John the Baptist. Um, he's, he's one of my favorite Bible characters. I know I have 50 million of them, but th this guy is pretty cool. You know, you have the description of John. We talked about him last week, so I'm not going to go way into that. But John's a guy who just uh, uh, basically shows up in the wilderness. In the wilderness. He's not going to the cities. He's just out in the boonies. And he gets a following, and people start coming out to him. And he's just this rowdy guy. And uh, he was uh, specifically a guy. You know, part of the reason that I like him is because he's so straightforward. And he doesn't mince words. And actually, it's, it's like that with most of the guys in the Bible. They, they don't mince words. They don't play around with stuff. They just tell you the truth. And um, it's something that's really refreshing. Um, I grew up in a family where um, there was no truth. The truth was always something that was relative to what was going on at the moment and what was true yesterday isn't true today. And, you know, the standards that you had yesterday, not for the kids, but for um, uh, other family members, um, kept changing around and, and that kind of stuff. And, you know, by the time I was a teenager, I was pretty jaded. I was pretty cynical uh, about anything. And, um, you, know, you know, when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate, and he started talking to Pilate about the truth. And Pilate said, what is truth? And he just ends the conversation right there. And that is, you know, that, that would be me. People would say, you know, talk to me about the truth. And I'm just like, yeah, right, truth. Give me a break. Because I've been lied to so often. And when I came into a relationship with Jesus, part of the reason that I came into it was because I was standing in front of a guy who just flat out told the truth. He didn't care what I thought. He didn't care, he care whether or not he was going to offend me. He just told me the truth. 
And you know what? When he told me the truth, it was one of those things where, you know, I'm sitting there listening to it. And he wasn't smiling or anything. It wasn't like he was doing it in a pleasant way. But I was sitting there listening to it. And on the inside, I'm just going, you are absolutely right. That is exactly who I am. It's exactly what I'm like. And he just basically went through and listed my sins. John the Baptist is that kind of guy. He'd come up and just tell you the truth. He's preaching in the wilderness. And, um, you know, you, again, when you look at the guy, the guy was a, you know, he's just a great character because he's described, he's walking around in a, in a, in a cl- clothed in camel's hair, which I guess he took a camel, I don't know where he got the camel skin, went out and slaughtered a camel. Where did he get that from? But he went out and slaughtered a camel, took a camel skin and made that his coat. Big old leather belt. That's what I think of when I think of John. Big old leather belt around his waist and a grasshopper leg hanging out of his mouth. You know, that's John the Baptist and just saying, repent! You know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he's out there doing that. You see, in, in, uh, again in verse 7, when the Pharisees come up to him, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he calls them sons of snakes, brood of vipers. That's what that means. You son of a snake. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And it's almost, it's almost like he's, he's like, I am really bummed out that you came. I'm really came, bummed out that you came to hear about this stuff because I was just hoping that you would go through life clueless and then get judged. And I don't know if that was his attitude or if he was just kind of smirking when he said, you bunch of snakes. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he tells them what needs to happen for them to uh, get into the kingdom of God. We talked about um, John's message last week, and John's message was about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, in, the, in, in these guys' minds, was the time when God was going to come and rule on the earth, specifically the Messiah was going to come and rule on the earth, and God was going to be actually in charge, that there was really going to be a theocracy where God is king and he runs things. Um, and he runs things the way that, it, that they should be run. In, uh, in fact, that is the biggest gripe that I hear from non-believers when I talk to them about Jesus. If God is good, then why is there so much evil in the world? If God is good, then um, why do bad things happen to good people? If God is good, then why do bad people get to keep on doing the things that they're doing and nothing happens to them? If God is good, why is that going on? And the answer to that is that God is not in charge. That's the answer. You know, when you, when you look at what's happening in this world, ultimately God is in charge of everything, but what he's done is he just backed off. He got a whole world that's rebelled against him, and he went, okay, and he backed off, and he lets us do what we want. And what ends up happening is somebody's going to be in charge, and the one who's in charge, the Bible says, uh, of most people's lives is actually Satan. There's a passage in, in 1 Corinthians that says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who won't believe. In fact, when we get to the next chapter, we're going to see Satan offering Jesus the planet. And he says, it's mine to give to whomever I please. And Jesus doesn't go, no, it's not. And basically what's, what's been going on is you've got a whole world that's in rebellion against God, and whether they know it or not, they're doing the things that the enemy wants them to do, and you end up with all this junk. You know, if, if every single person on this planet, you know, if, if, every, if everybody in this town just had Jesus in their heart, and this is what I mean by that, they're not doing religion, they're not, they're not doing um, uh, fake morality, that kind of stuff. They asked Christ to come in their heart and had a change of heart where they decided, you know what? It's not good for me to be a liar. You know what? It's not good for me to cheat people. You know what? It's not good for me to trash people. It's not good for me, you know, and you go through that. It's not good for me to steal. It's not, and, and they a- actually have a change of heart where they're actually doing what the Bible has to say. You think the world might be a little bit better? We wouldn't need cops. Immediately. They'd just be, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need anybody to cover those things. And again, the reason uh, we have a lot of the stuff that's going on in this world is because we have people who are in absolute rebellion against God. They're doing exactly the opposite of what God has to say. So one guy does one thing, another guy does another thing. They all get together and do all this junk, and you got wars, and you got family dis- families destroyed, and you got cities destroyed, and you got riots, and you've got all this all this stuff where people are just doing whatever they stink and please. There's a whole book in the Old Testament had a theme. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. It's the book of Judges. 
And it is nothing but a train wreck all the way through the book. Nothing but a train wreck. And that's what we got with this world. Well, that's going to end. And Jesus is going to come back. And the Bible says that he's going to rule and reign. And that he's actually going to take care of it. And there's actually going to be justice. God is actually going to deal with people who refuse to repent. He's actually going to deal with people who refuse to do the right thing. And he's going to do it immediately. And the world's going to be different because of it. It's a period of time when God's actually in control. That's what they're looking for. And what John says is, you're not ready for it. You're looking for it, but you're not ready for it. You think, you think you're on God's side. You need to really get on God's side. And these were a bunch of Jews. So these are Jewish people. They're the people of Israel, sons of Abraham. You know, John addresses that with these guys. And they thought that, that, that because they were Israelis, that they, because that they came from Abraham, that they were automatically in. And what John did when he was baptizing people was he was basically letting them know that you're not in. And that you're not in on the same level as a Gentile's not in. In fact, uh, the only people who really got baptized in this kind of way that John's talking about were Gentiles who converted to Judaism. So back in those days, and I, I imagine it's still like that today, if you decided to become Jewish, you wanted, you wanted to uh, follow the, the uh, Moses law, and you wanted to become Jewish, you had to be baptized, and it was a picture of washing away your Gentileness. The Jews considered Gentiles to be so rotten that everything that had to do with being a Gentile had to be washed away from you before you could become Jewish. And so that was the idea. And what John did that was different was he, he basically looked at the people of Israel and he said, you know what, you think that Gentiles need to be, you know, have their Gentileness washed away before they can be part of the kingdom of God. Guess what? You need it too. You're no different than they are. And it was a radical concept during the time. And so all these people recognized that. And so they came out, came out and they began uh, following John. Um, one, of the, one of the things that John talks, talks about in this passage is the kingdom of God. And we hit on that last week and just, just real quick. Again, when you're talking about the kingdom of God, you're talking about that whole thing with Messiah coming and ruling and reigning on the earth. But here's the other thing that you're talking about. You're, you're talking about a situation where the kingdom of God may not be here right now, but it's coming. And what we're supposed to be doing as Christians is infiltrating a kingdom that's not ours. Um, basically, you know, when people say this world is not my home, what they're doing is they're getting it from scripture. Because when you become a believer, you change citizenship. And now your citizenship isn't just a citizenship in America, it's a citizenship in heaven. Now let me state this to you. I came from a military family and um, I'm really patriotic. You know, um, some of the stuff that's going on with the NFL and not, not standing during the uh, national anthem and that whole thing, I hate it. I can't stand it. I don't even want to, want to watch a game. You got guys doing the stuff that they're doing. Um, I understand that there, there may be problems. That's not the place to go after it. That's, that's nonsense. And uh, um, I, I grew up in a family where, uh, remember in the old days before you, before you had cable and uh, the TV channels would go off? And right before the TV channel would go, go off, they'd have a flag waving on the, on the TV screen, and then they'd play the national anthem. And um, my dad was a Marine Corps sergeant, and whenever that would happen, it just, it just kind of cracked me up. I thought it was weird. But when the, when the flag would come up and the national anthem would, would start playing, he would stand up in the living room and do one of these. <laughs> and he would sit, sit there while the national anthem was going, while he was, while he was saluting the flag. And I thought he was weird, and I still kind of think that's a little bit weird. But he did it, and actually, I liked it. You know, he had, he had some real problems, but that wasn't one of them. You know, I, uh, America was founded by believers, and um, I'm, a, you know, I'm a history buff. It was founded by believers, you know, you got a history teacher that's telling you different, get a new history teacher. Got a history book that's telling you different, read another book. You know, basically, it was founded by believers. And the reason that God has blessed this place is because of Christian principles that were laid down. Our whole law is based on biblical principles that I can show you um, out of the Old Testament. And so 
Um, God blessed this place because of it, and he did. Um, I have traveled in a, um, a, you know, all across the world in a number of different places. This is a really, really, really good place to live. People who down our country, um, I think that they don't know what they're talking about. My wife and I um, went to Mexico, and this isn't a you know, cap on Mexico, um, because I like Mexico. But we went down, we went down to Mexico um, when uh, I was younger. I had a boss that would take me on, on uh, trips down there. And so we'd go down and hang out in Mexico. And I, you know, I just love the area and stuff. But you know what? You get down there and it's different than America. And then, you know, there was stuff going on and there was you know, really poverty stricken places and stuff like that. And uh, Bobby kind of couldn't handle it. And so um, when we came back, we went uh, two different times with my boss and it was the last time that we went because now she won't allow me to go anymore. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking. But the last time that we went, she came back and we're walking into the airport in Los Angeles and there is a picture of George H.W. Bush sitting on the wall and as soon as she saw the picture, she started weeping. I'm, you know, top, I'm talking about sobbing because um, she was so glad to be in the United States. And you know what? It's absolutely true. Go to Russia, I would never want to live there. I go, you know, I've gone to a number, number of other, other places, India and places like that. I would never want to live there. i um, gone to Israel. Love Israel. I love it. I like this place better. We got a better deal here. And again, it's because of what, what God's done. Having said all that, this is not my home. This is not my home. And the United States even though I'm a citizen of the United States and I'm proud to be one, not my home. My home's in heaven. And I'm, a, I'm an ambassador of the kingdom of God. I'm here to infiltrate. And I'm here to try to get people you know, on a right relationship with my king so that they can become citizens of the kingdom also. And so the, again, the, the Bible talks about that whole thing. There's a passage in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where it says this, he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And so that's part of our, our ministry. Jesus said that we're to be in the world, um, but we're not to be of it. And um, it's something that I need to keep in mind when I'm looking at what's happening around me, um, whether it's um, how I influence elections or anything like that. I need to understand that, again, this world isn't my home. Doesn't mean that I'm not supposed to be doing what's right um, in a situation and um, staving off evil and that kind of stuff, but this world is not my home. And I, I, I need to keep the main thing the main thing. Jesus, uh, John in this passage tells people to repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then you see his um, uh, attitude towards the Pharisees who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits, verse 8, worthy of repentance. And repentance is a big deal in the Bible. Um, when, when he's speaking about being a child of the kingdom, um, becoming somebody who is ready for the kingdom, uh, again, he talks about doing this thing with repentance. Repentance is a Christian word. It's a biblical word. Lots of people don't know what it means. This is what it means. It means to do a 180. It means to stop going the direction you're going, turn around and go the opposite direction, specifically in your head. You know, everything, everything that we do outwardly starts inwardly. It's always like that. And that's what God expects from us. He expects an inward change, an inward turning to take place. Um, and while I'm talking about repentance here, let me, let me just talk about an issue that comes up. Um, and this is kind of kind of theological and you know, it seems kind of dumb, but people do this. There are people who are right now preaching, teaching that repentance is not necessary for salvation. That I don't, I don't have to repent. All I have to do is believe in Jesus and that's it. And then I'll be saved. Here's a problem with that. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, repent and believe are connected all the way through scripture. Um, here's, a, here's a list for you. Let me, let me find this. Where did I put it? Um, repentance is, was the first word in John the Baptist's gospel. And, you know, verse two, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look at um, chapter four real quick, verse 17. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So it's the first word of Jesus's gospel. Um, when Jesus, I'm not going to take you through every single one of those verses. They're up on the, on the wall. You can look them up yourself. But when Jesus sent the disciples out to preach, um, he told them to preach repentance. Um, when um, he gave the, the um, great commission to us in Luke chapter 24, that's what that next one is, 46 through 47, repentance is what we're supposed to be preaching. Um, when Peter in Acts 2.38 finishes his sermon, what the people do is they say, men and brethren, what should we do? And what Peter told them to do was repent. And then finally, Paul in Acts 26, 19 through 20 is talking about when he first got saved and the first thing that he did and what God had told him his ministry was gonna be and it was to preach repentance to the Gentiles. So repentance is something that you see all through the New Testament. It's something that you see all through the Old Testament. And there are guys who try to make it something that was only applicable during the Gospels. It's just complete nonsense. If I don't repent, I'm going to be having some problems with God, is the point that I'm making. And so what is supposed to be happening again is I'm going one direction. I need to stop and go the opposite direction. So what do I need to repent from? So let me give you a list. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And again, God isn't, you know, he's not vague on these things. You know, um, one, of the, one of the things I, I like to point out specifically to Christians is that non-Christians know exactly what you're supposed to look like. They all do. And when you don't look like it, they'll let you know. Or they'll let somebody know. Um, and they'll do it behind your back. But they'll let you know when you're not doing the things that, God's, that they know that God's called you to do. If you look down in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. And that's that whole concept. Actually, the context here is uh, Paul is talking to a church that had a guy in their church who was sleeping with his stepmom. And he tells them, you need to get the guy out of your fellowship. If he's not going to repent, you need to get him out. In 2 Corinthians, um, the guy had repented, and Paul told him in 2 Corinthians, you need to let him back in. He's repented. So, you know, these guys were all over the page on this stuff. In any case, he, he tells them, I told you not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet certainly I did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. And that's that whole principle of I'm supposed to be in the world, but I'm not of it. I, I'm in the world. I'm going to be around people who don't know Jesus and people who don't know, know Jesus do these kinds of things. And so I need to understand that I'm around them, but I don't have to be like them. And that's what he goes on to say. Verse 11, he says, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler. Covetousness is, is greed. Um, idolater is somebody who puts things before God. A reviler is somebody who trashes people. Somebody who's a slanderer, basically. Or a drunkard, we know what a drunkard is. Or an extortioner, an extortioner is a ripoff. Not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? Now go to the next chapter in verse 9. In verse 9 he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators. A fornicator is somebody who has sex outside of marriage. Sex is something that is blessed by God. It was made by God. It was designed to be a blessing to his people inside of marriage. And it's not designed for anything else other than inside of marriage. If you take it outside of the marriage relationship, what ends up happening is you wreck it and you wreck yourself. And it's one of the reasons that God says it's not to be done. 
So neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, adulterers, that's pretty straightforward, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Those are two different words for homosexuals in the Bible that talk about um, basically the, the person who is acting like the male in the relationship and the person who's acting like the female in the relationship, the giver and the taker, basically, in, in a homosexual relationship. And then he says, nor thieves, nor covetous. And again, covetous means being greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So if you have that lifestyle, that's where you're living. That's, that's who you are. The Bible is clear on this. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it doesn't matter what kind of background you've got. You know, people, people will say to me, well, you know, I've got a family that's been Christian back five generations. You just got saved, you know, when you were a kid, but I've got a long list of pastors in my background. And, you know, as if that's going to get them in or something. Or, well, I said a prayer when I was 12. And so that means I'm a believer and it doesn't really matter what, uh, we all sin. You know what? Christians are not sinless, but they do sin less, don't they? Yeah. And that's the point. You have to turn away from things. These are things that will, will keep you from the kingdom of God. And so if I've got a person who's standing in front of me and they're shacking up with their girlfriend and they're like, God is okay with this. No big deal. Shut up, Steve. I know that I'm dealing with somebody who is not walking with Jesus. If I'm, if I'm standing in front of a person who is in a, adultery, and they're in unrepentant adultery. And I'm talking to them about it. And they're like, I can do what I want. It doesn't matter. That, that verse doesn't apply to me. I know I'm dealing with somebody who does not know Jesus. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. If I'm dealing with a homosexual who is unrepentant about it. If I'm dealing with a thief who is unrepentant about it. How about greedy? If I'm dealing with somebody who's greedy, that's what covetousness is and they are unrepentant about it. I'm dealing with somebody who has a problem with their walk with God, and I'm not dealing with somebody who's following Jesus. If I'm dealing with a reviler, if somebody's standing in front of me and, and every time I have a talk with them, all they're doing is talking about somebody else, I'm dealing with somebody who doesn't know Jesus. They will not inherit the kingdom of God, nor extortioners, and so on, obviously, that whole thing. And so, repentance is something that needs to take place. I can't claim to be a follower of Jesus and have ha exactly the same lifestyle that I had before I was a follower of Jesus. If the God of the universe has come into your life, there will be changes. Now, again, Christians are not sinless. They do sin less though, right? And there can be people who have problems with some of these areas, but they struggle with them. And there's always a, a period of time in a Christian's life when, when they give their life to Christ and it's a real deal, absolute, I want to follow Jesus thing. And then there is a struggle that takes place between doing what the world wants to do and doing what Jesus wants to do. But you know what? There's a struggle. There's conviction of sin. There's the Holy Spirit speaking to them going, that's not where you're supposed to be. That's not how it's supposed to go. And there is a struggle going on. Somebody who's struggling, you work with all day long. But somebody who is just in that stuff and they don't give a rip, there's a major problem there. And if they think that they're going, they're going to inherit the kingdom of God, they are majorly deceived. And so again, if you're in a situation like that, you've got to repent. And again, it's a simple thing. I decide I'm, not, I'm going to stop doing things the way that I've always done them, stop doing things the way that my friends have always done them, stop doing the things the way that you know, I just decided that I want to do because I'm smarter than God or something. That's what that comes down to. And decide that maybe I ought to go with what God thinks. Maybe I ought to do that. And here's another, another way that you can do that. Because I've been in positions where I recognize I'm doing something that God doesn't want me to do. And you know what? I really don't want to repent. Is that a bad attitude? Yeah, absolutely. So you know what I do with that? With that, I repent of it. And I just basically go to God and go, look at me. I know it's wrong and I still want to do it. And I need help here. Will you please help me repent? And God will do exactly that. Look at verse 11. And he says, and such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. That means set apart for God's use. 
you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know, when, I, when you go through that list, a number of those things in that list is exactly what I was. I used to be sexually immoral. Um, I used to be an idolater. Um, I'm not going to give you everything. <laughs> but I used to be a number of those things. I could go through and give you a number there. But I used to be a number of those things. And what Jesus did was he came into my life and things are different now. Radical changes took place because I committed my heart to Jesus and he changed me from the inside out. Like I said before, when the God of the universe comes in your life, changes happen. Changes happen. And repentance is one of those things that needs to take place. And so again, you have that. So don't let anybody you know, trick you or deceive you. By the way, when you look at that passage, um, homosexuality is mentioned in that passage. You know, you notice that it's just right, you know, kind of like right smack in the middle of all the other sins, as if it's no different. You know why? Because it's no different, and not necessarily in the in the in the sense of you may get different consequences from a lifestyle, but it's no different as far as God's concerned. So, um, you guys that have problems with homosexualities, homosexuality, do you have problems with fornication? You have problems with homosexuality. You have problems with people who shack up. You have problems with homosexuality? Do you have problems with people who are drunks? You have problems with homosexuality? Do you have problems with thieves? You have problems with homosexuality? Do you have problems with adulterers? See what I mean? And from God's point of view, all this stuff is just junk. It's all junk. You got problems with homosexuality? God considers a reviler, somebody who's a slanderer on the same level as a homosexual something to keep in mind. When God looks at our sin, he just looks at our sin and it's just sin to him and it all needs to be repented of. Again, you don't, um, you don't want to stay the same way you are. Here's the, here's the cool thing about God. God doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care what you're into. He loves you the way that you are. You can go through that list and every single one of those people that would be in that kind of lifestyle, God loves them. He just doesn't want to leave them that way. And you can see a difference again when somebody becomes a believer. Back over to Matthew 3. Um, in the passage, um, John talks to the Pharisees about the wrath to come. And that's the idea that God's been watching and he's not pleased. Things are, gonna, things are gonna be coming down. And he lets them know that they need to bear fruits worthy of repentance, verse eight. And he, um, down in verse 10, he says, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And again, he goes on, on with the passage. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, again, people get into their head is that um, because God doesn't necessarily judge them immediately that he's okay with it or something. You ever talk to somebody like that? Well, if God was mad at me, at me about this whole thing, then why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he wipe me out? Why doesn't he, why doesn't he you know, judge me? If God's mad at me, apparently he's not mad. And people can have that kind of attitude. Christians can get that kind of attitude. And you need to understand that when God's dealing with somebody, he, he doesn't start out with, you know, uh, putting the screws to them. What he starts out with is with the goodness of God, the grace of God. There's a passage in Romans 2 that says, it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. In fact, that's written to a group of people who are unrepentant. Don't you know? It's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. And God always starts out with his goodness. It does not mean when he's doing that, that he approves of my sin. And it doesn't mean he approves of your sin either. You know, there was a, there was a point in, in my walk when I was a young Christian where I did something and I remember thinking to myself, I think I even said it to somebody, I don't even feel guilty about this. And a little while later, I, I started thinking about what I said and I went, oh man, because it was absolutely wrong what I'd done. And I realized that what was happening wasn't that God approved of it or that it was okay, but my heart was, heart was getting hard in that area. And it's one of the things that we need to watch out for. There's a passage in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes that says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That's the idea of, I didn't get judged. God must be okay with it. I can move on with it. Either God's not there or he doesn't care. Either one. 
There's another passage in Numbers 32 where, where Moses is talking to the people of Israel about a, a certain specific sin, idolatry and stuff. And he said, but if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. And that's one of the things, again, that we need to remember about the Lord. He may be pouring out grace on me at the very beginning, but if I don't turn, if I don't fix things, if I don't make things right, then it's all coming out. It's all coming out in the wash, and he's going he's gonna to let it be known. That just happened this week, didn't it? You be sure your sin will find you out. We have politicians running for office, think that they can do whatever they want, hot mics, all of that kind of stuff, and boom, there it is. And Satan's just like a hot mic in your life. One of the, one of the things that, that the enemy will do with you is he'll get you into, into a position where he gets you thinking squirrely and he gets you to go against what God wants you to do. He'll come up to you and say, you know what, you're all alone. Nobody knows you're here. Nobody who's here knows you. You can do whatever you want. Nobody will know. And then you do it. And then he comes along and he goes, wow, you're a scumbag. That's the first thing that he does. And then what he does is he sets it up. So he lets it be known what you've done, what you've said, the way that you've acted, all of that kind of stuff. And it all comes out. And that's just Satan. And on top of it, God, if he knows that you're being hypocritical, that, you're, that you have two faces, you have one face in front of the believers and another face in front of the, un other belie the unbelievers, he'll let that be known too. And the reason that God doesn't isn't because he wants to trash you, but it's because you need to change. But he doesn't just let it go. There's another passage in Proverbs 28, 13 that says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. And that's the good thing about following the Lord. You know what? I'm always going to sin. There's always going to be a time when I, when I fall short of what God wants me to do. Um, the best thing to do at a point like that is not to go hide after I've sinned, but just go straight to the Lord and go, God, here I am again. Here's Steve Winery in all his glory, once again, doing exactly what you told me not to. And then ask the Lord to forgive. And that's what God wants from us. He wants a, a heart that's just for real with him. Back over to Matthew 3, he says, do not think that, to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God's able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And like I said before, there are people who think that because they, they have some kind of godly heritage that they've got an in with God. You know, my grandma knew you, Jesus, and my mom knows you, Jesus. And so, therefore, I got an in. Or I know the pastor. I've had, you know, I've been a pastor for a long time now and, you know, I'm pretty straightforward and, and, you know, it kind of freaks me out when people come up and call me pastor. You know, I don't know, I kind of don't know what to do with that because my name's actually Steve. But <laughs> I'll come up and say pastor and I know it's, a, I, I understand. It's, it's respectful. I, I appreciate that. Um, but a, a lot of times when, when an unbeliever finds out that I'm a pastor, they'll say things to me like, why don't you put a good word into the man upstairs for me? Direct quote from multiple guys. Women ne have never said that to me. It's only guys that say that to me. Put in a good word for, you know, to the man upstairs for me. And I always answer, put in a good word yourself. I'd say it nicer than that, but you, know, you don't need me. And the fact that you know me isn't going get, to get you any kind of in with God. In fact, it might get you in trouble with God. God might be going, oh, Steve Winter, yeah, I know that guy. You hang with him? What's the deal? <laughs> you know? That kind, of, that kind of stuff. You need to have your own relationship with God. And you're not going to get in because your mom's a Christian. And you're not going to get in because grandma's a Christian. You know, in the Old Testament, there's no word for grandma. There's no word for, gran for grandpa. There's no word for great-grandpa, great-grandma. Nothing like that. It's only sons and daughters in the Old Testament. And I'm talking about in the Hebrew. So when you'll, you'll read a passage and it'll say, for example, Josiah was a son of David. And when I was a young Christian, I was like, what's that? Because then I found out that Josiah is generations down the line. So what's that about? Was he a son of David or not? And what I'm thinking about is in our terms, it doesn't say great, great, great grandson of David. It says son of David. And again, the reason is because the Hebrew has no word for grandparents. It's just son. And in that context, it just means an ancestor of David. 
And then there are times when it means son of David. I'm convinced that the reason that God did that is for the purpose of letting us know that there are no, there are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. You don't get grandfathered in. It's something that you need to have on your own. Every single one of us is a son or a daughter of the father. And that's, that's how it's supposed to go. Every single one of us is adopted into the family of God. I'm not in there by osmosis. I'm not in there because I'm in the building or I'm in the house or, or whatever. I'm in there because I have chosen to make God my father. That's what you do when you're adopted. I've been adopted a couple of different times. You go into court, you stand in front of a judge. The judge says, would you like to be in this family? And you say, yay or nay? You say, yes or no? And both times I said, yes, got my name changed, became, became part of a new family. And that's exactly what happens when you become a believer. That's why God uses that kind of terminology because you have a choice in this matter and you make the choice. Now, what's made, that's, that's what makes you a son again or a daughter of God. And so you can't um, look at your heritage. But I will say this about grandparents. If you have a grandma that's praying for you, you have no chance. God says that, you know, grandmas, God listens to grandmas and does exactly what they say. You know, it's, a, it's kind of a cool thing. I had a grandma who was a Christian, and I, I'm convinced that one of the reasons that I followed Jesus is because she prayed for me forever. And uh, um, she let me know that. I've been praying for you, Stevie, forever. <laughs> oh, sorry, Grandma. <laughs> In any case, Jesus is, is there, there's wrath coming, but if I will come to God and I will ask for forgiveness, I'm delivered from the wrath of God. There's a passage in Thessalonians that says this, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned, see that again? You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so I've got a promise from God that if I'll turn and I'll follow after him, that I'll, I'll be delivered. It goes on in this passage, and it lets you know there's no escaping this judgment. Verse 12, he says, His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he'll thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gra gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so in the first place, he talks about trees that give fruit and other trees that don't. The trees that don't bring forth good fruit, he cuts them down, off into the fire they go. And then he uses this example of a threshing floor. And we're not used to that. We don't, you know, we don't know what that, what that looks like. But back in those days, they didn't have all the farm machinery that we have, and they had threshing floors. So they'd take an area that was usually up on top of a ridge, and it was a rocky area, and they'd go and they'd, they'd cut the wheat, they'd bring it up there, they'd throw it down on the ground, and they'd thresh it, which means they'd beat it with sticks, basically. And they'd knock the grain off. And then they'd have another guy that was in there, and he would take a, a pitchfork, put it underneath the, the stalks of the grain and throw it up into the air and all the stalks would blow off because they're lighter than the grain. The wind would blow them off and the grain would fall down, clean, you know, be clean and they'd pick it up and they'd go use it. If they were doing it inside, they had what was called a winnowing fan. And so these guys would have fans and they would, they would make, the air, you know, make, the, make the breeze basically and it's, it's like using a, a blower on this stuff. Some of you are gonna go out and blow leaves. When you blow leaves, all the light stuff blows off, all the stuff that hasn't been rained on, like just now. <laughs> I'm thinking about leaves right now. All the, all the light stuff will blow off and all the st heavy stuff will stay there, same principle. And what they did with the light stuff, which was called the chaff, was they took it outside, they burnt it. And what, what John does here is he says, this is exactly what the Lord's gonna be doing. There's going to be, there's gonna be fruit, there's gonna be chaff, and the fruit is going to be used and the chaff is going to be burnt. Pretty straightforward and there's no getting away with it. He says at the beginning, his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. Not going to get missed. And so again, it's something that needs to be taken care of. Then you have the baptism of Jesus. Why did Jesus get baptized? And that's a question that John had. Jesus comes from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. 
Um, you know, whenever, whenever you think about baptism in the Bible, a lot of times uh, people think that baptism is something that saves you. Baptism is something that does something for you to get you to heaven. And when you're thinking about baptism, looking at the baptism of Jesus is a really good thing. Did Jesus' bapti- baptism do anything to him? Well, yeah, it did. It got him wet. But that's all. Because Jesus didn't sin. So his baptism didn't cleanse him from sin, did it? Um, Did it show his repentance? Jesus didn't need to repent. He's a guy who'd never sinned. All it did, all, all that the baptism did was identify him with the people of God. It identified him as somebody who agreed with the stuff that John the Baptist was teaching. That's all that it did. It wasn't something that could ever change the nature of Jesus. The nature of Jesus was God in human flesh. And so his baptism could do nothing to change him. Guess what? It's the same exact, same, exact thing with your baptism. All baptism is is getting wet. You get, in, you get into water, you get dipped in the water, and it's just a, a, a ceremony that most of us go through at least once a day, you know, well, some of you. I usually do it at least once a day because if I don't, I stink. But, you know, we're, we, we dip ourselves in water. That's called a bath or you take a shower or whatever. We do that all the time. And so baptism is just a, a getting dipped in water specifically. What Jesus said that this was doing was fulfilling all righteousness. And that's exactly what baptism does. The Bible teaches that when a person gets saved, what's happening is the God of the universe, again, is coming inside of them. And he's changing them from the inside out. The Bible also says that on the day that that takes place, you get a brand new life. In fact, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in the, passage that, um, in the same passage that I was reading from earlier, it says this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And when you get saved, that's exactly what takes place. In Romans chapter 7, it compares our baptism to a burial. And so when I'm getting baptized, which the word itself means to immerse, when I'm getting baptized, I'm getting dunked in water. And First Corinthians, or Romans chapter 7, or excuse me, I said chapter 7, it's chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 says that when that happens, it's a picture of me getting buried, that my old man has died. And then I come up out of the water and it's a picture of a new life in Christ. So just like Jesus died and got buried and then rose again, that's what happens in my life. Now, when I get dipped in the water, I don't really die. And when I get pulled up out of the water, I'm not really risen from the dead. It just represents those things. And so baptism is an outward showing of something that's already taken place inwardly. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, in the book of Acts, when, the, uh, when Philip is talking to the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch hears about Jesus and he's asked if he believes and he, sa- and he says, I believe here's water, what's preventing me from being baptized? And what Philip says to the guy is, you can if you believe with all your heart. And he goes, I do. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. And that's when he gets baptized. That's the qualification for baptism. The guy wasn't saved when he got dipped in the water. The guy was saved when he believed. The guy wasn't saved when he got wet. The guy was saved when he repented and turned to Christ. That's when he was saved. And then the the water was an outward sign of that. Um, There's a passage in um, Ephesians chapter 2 that speaks about our salvation. And it says this, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For by grace, you've been saved. The word grace means unmerited favor. Again, it means getting good things that I don't deserve. I'm going to heaven, not because I deserve it or because I've earned it or because I've paid my way or because I've been a good Christian boy. I'm going to heaven because I don't deserve it. I'm going to heaven because I didn't earn it. I'm going to heaven because God is good and God in his goodness reached out to me and gave me a ticket to heaven. That's what happened with me. 
And if you're a Christian, that's what happened to you too. So by grace, we've been saved through faith. And the word faith just means trust. I trust Jesus that what he said was true. I trust Jesus that when he went to the cross and he said that he was gonna die in my place, that he was actually taking my sin upon him. I trust him that the life that he called me to is something that's real and, and that can happen in my life. I trust him. And so I've exercised trust in him. And then he says, and that's not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I had guys on my football teams, um, one guy in particular that was always tooting his own horn, always talking about himself, always thought that he was a hot shot and that kind of stuff. Unattractive, absolutely unattractive. Do you think heaven is going to be like that? Everybody's going to be up in the heavenly end zone, you know, doing little dances and spiking the ball or something, talking about how great they are? No, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But there are works. It goes on, it says, for we are his workmanship. And I like that passage. That word up there, workmanship, literally is poema. In Greek, it's where we get our word poem. It means work of art. When God's at work in your life, he thinks you're a work of art. It's what he's making you into. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let me just finish it up with this. I, you know, I, I've talked to people um, a lot. I used to work with guys who, who were involved in cults and stuff. And whenever I get to a passage like this, they, they don't understand the work of God in a believer's life. And I'll say, you know what? The Bible talks about the fact that the reason we're going to heaven is because of what Jesus did, not because of what we did. And they always come back with, you know, Steve, it's grace plus works. Well, if it's grace plus works, if it's unmerited favor, me getting good things that I don't deserve, plus all the things that I do to get what I do deserve, you just cancel the two out. It doesn't work. And the Bible's actually really clear on that. And so when I'm, when I'm talking to them, I'll read them a passage like this, and they'll go, but look at the rest of the verse. It says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so we have to do the works to get the salvation. They always do that kind of stuff. And maybe some of you are thinking that way too. What the Bible teaches is that my, the works that I do in my life are a result of the work that God's done in my life. They are not the cause of the work. They're the result. God came inside, he began changing me. And so now things are different. That's the way that it goes. And I like to use an illustration. I'm going to use my dolphin illustration. Some of you could come up and just, you know, Bobby, we want to come up and just share my dolphin illustration. No, I'm just joking. I've been using this forever. It's a great illustration, and I refuse to leave it behind. Guy's down, on, uh, down on the, at the ocean, and he sees dolphins out in the ocean. He always loved Flipper when he was a kid, and so he wants to swim with the dolphins. He wants to become a dolphin. So he jumps into the ocean, and he swims with the dolphins. Is he a dolphin? No. The dolphins have accepted him. The dolphins consider him to be one of them. And he's swimming with the dolphins in the ocean. They love him. Is he a dolphin? No. So he figures that out. So he decides, I need to be more like a dolphin. So he starts eating raw fish. So now he's eating raw fish and he's swimming with the dolphins. Is he a dolphin? No. Um, he understands that. He wants to look more like a dolphin, so he puts on a dolphin costume. Even gets the dolphin costume sewn to his body so that he actually can't take it off. He looks like a real dolphin. Now he looks like a dolphin and he eats like a dolphin and he swims with the dolphins. Is he a dolphin? No. He's a, he's a goofball in a dolphin suit. That's what he is. So he figures that out. So he decides to get some, some plastic surgery, has a hole drilled in the back of his head so that he can breathe like a dolphin, has it connected to his little dolphin suit. So now he looks like a dolphin. He swims with the dolphins. He eats like a dolphin. He breathes like a dolphin. In every way that you could look at him, he is a dolphin. Is he a dolphin? No. Again, he's a wacko in a dolphin suit. And that's what a churchgoer is. They look like a Christian, they talk like a Christian, they even eat like a Christian. Afterwards, you're gonna go out and eat, right? That's what Christians do. <laughs> they hang with the dolphin, or they hang with the Christians, and that kind of stuff, and you can do all of that stuff and think that you're a Christian, and you're not. You're just, you're just a guy in a dolphin suit. That's all you are. The only way that guy's ever gonna be a dolphin is by an absolute change of nature. And that's the difference. Dolphins don't wake up in the morning going, you know what? I need to make sure I look like a dolphin today. 
you know, they don't take out their little dolphin mirrors and, you know, put on dolphin makeup or, you know, whatever a dolphin would do. They don't do that, right? They don't like, you know, I don't really have a dolphin nose. I need to get some plastic surgery or something. They're not worried about what they look like. They look like a dolphin. And they're not going, you know what, got to eat. You know, I really like some Cap'n Crunch, but I got to eat some fish today because I want to be a dolphin. I have to act like a dolphin. I got I to gotta make sure that I'm talking like a dolphin. They don't sit there and go, you know what, today I need, to, I need to concentrate on breathing out the back of my head so that I can be a dolphin. Dolphins do what they do because they're dolphins. And that's the deal with believers. Believers do the things that they do because they're believers. It, the things they do don't make them believers. The things they do identify them as believers. And that's the difference. So you can go to church and you can try to act like a Christian and you can try to be nice and you can try to do all those, those things. You can try really hard. I get it. And what you'll find out is you're not a dolphin and you need a change of nature. And that's what God calls you to. Jesus, when, you know, when John's talking to these guys about repentance and, and all of this stuff, what he's calling them to is to become members of the kingdom of God. You have to change allegiance. Jesus later on talks about God being our father, and he wants you in the family of God. What he's calling you to is adoption. You have to say yes to the Lord. Um, in another passage, it talks about uh, salvation is, or actually marriage is like a picture of salvation. My wife is like the church, and I'm like Jesus. Um, guess what? My wife didn't just show up in my house one day and tell me, hi, my name's Bobby. We're married. I live here. It didn't happen. There was a whole thing that went on between me and her, and there was a commitment to, to her from me and a commitment from her to me. And again, that's a picture of salvation. You're not engaged because you hang out with somebody. You're not married because you've been over to their house. You're engaged when you're in love with somebody and you commit their, your life to them. And you're married when you've gone through the marriage vows. And again, it's the same, the same picture. You don't just, it, it doesn't just happen to you. You have to make a choice. And that's what God calls every single one of us to is a choice. And he wants it to be a real one and he wants it to be a distinct one and he wants it to be something that's a part of your will where you've said yes to him. You may be sitting there and maybe you're new and you've never heard any of this stuff and you're like, what is this dude talking about dolphins, you know, and that kind of thing. But you understand what I'm talking about. You came in the building and the reason you came in is because you wanted on some level your life to be different. And I'm telling you, you can have exactly that. You can have your life be absolutely different, but it's not going to be different in the way that you think it is. Um, maybe when you came in the building, it's going to be different, not because you've come to church, because, but because you've come to Christ. It's going to be different, not because you got religion. It's going to be different because Jesus got you. It's not about church. It's not about religion. It's about Jesus and having a personal relationship with him. And the Bible talks about the fact, again, that we need to repent. We need to decide in our head, I'm, I'm not going this way anymore. This has got to stop. And I want to turn around. That's the first step. And then the Bible says believe. And that means trust. You trust in Christ. And what Jesus had said is that if you'll turn to him and you'll repent from your sins, that he will come into your life and he'll make absolute changes in you. He'll make you part of the family of God. And the Bible says that you need to receive him. To as many as received him, he said, um, they'll become the children of God. You want to be a child of God? You have to receive You have to receive the God that you want to be the child of. You have to say yes. So I'm going to give you a chance to do that. You know what? You may have grown up in church and you're sitting there going, you know what, Steve? I don't know, you know, all the stuff that you just said. I don't, I don't know which side I'm on. And there's no reason to walk out like that. You can know exactly what you're doing. You can know, know exactly who you're following. And you can have a change that's absolute and radical, totally. And you can have it today if you want it. And that's what God offers to you. So I'm going to offer it to you too. The Bible says that if you'll call on the name of the Lord, that he'll hear you and he'll save you. That if you'll confess your sins, that he'll forgive you and he'll cast your sin as far as east is from west and he'll never remember it again. It'll be gone. Clean slate. And then he'll begin a relationship with you where you're his daughter. He's your father. You're his son. 
um, and he's your father. And if you like that, I'm going to pray for you and give you a chance to do that. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask those of you who know you need to repent, you know you need to get your life right with the Lord, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand up, and I'm going to pray for you. Then I'm going to ask you to stand up, and I mean stand up. And I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me, asking Christ to take control of your life. So if you'd like to do that, you just start thinking about that and uh, while we're praying, and you decide. Decide what you want to do. Let's pray. And again, Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you uh, for the fact that I, I just like it that um, the word's just pretty straightforward. Um, doesn't mince words, doesn't, doesn't mess around. Um, pretty straightforward. And Lord, we're all in a position um, where we need you. Um, I, I need you just as much as I did when I first got saved. There's no difference. And Lord, I, I thank you that even though I didn't know everything that I was getting into when I got into you, you did. And you had me covered. And God, I know you have these people covered too. Um, you know where they've come from. You know what they've done. You know who they've been. You know who they haven't been. And you love them. And you want them. And you don't want them to remain the same. But you're going to be the one who does the changes. Lord, I just pray for those that are here this morning that you give them boldness to finally come to you. And while your head is, heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you're here this morning, you know you need Jesus. You know you need to come to him. Why don't you raise your hand up? I'm going to pray for you. You raise it up high so I can see it. You want to give your life to Christ. You want to follow after Jesus. You want to repent of your sin. Give you a couple more seconds. You know what? You can, you can walk out of here exactly the same as you were when you came in. Or you can walk out of here absolutely different. And it's all about what you want. God wants you. Do you want him? So if that's you this morning, you know that you need Jesus. You know that you need to straighten things out between you and him. You raise your hand up. Okay. Let's all stand.